Excited to welcome David Hollander, author of How Basketball Can Save the World, 13 Guiding Principles for Reimagining What's Possible, to the Basketball Podcast. Hollander is an assistant dean and clinical professor with the Tisch Institute for Global Sport at New York University and received NYU's highest faculty honor, the Distinguished Teaching Award. His innovative courses have been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, SLAM, and CBS News. He sits on advisory boards for ESPNW, the Earl Monroe New Renaissance Basketball School, and the NYU Entrepreneurial Institute. David, welcome to the podcast. I uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, this is my kind of audience. Yeah, it is your kind of audience, and you know most coaches align with your passion for basketball as a vehicle for change, uh, whether it be in, on an individual or society level. So you're speaking to an audience that definitely knows what you're saying and appreciates what you're saying. Uh, because at our core, basketball coaches are continually trying to stimulate our players and teams to improve and grow for the present and the future. So what I'm curious about in reading your book and you sharing this with your audience is how can we approach this as basketball coaches for the greater purpose, which you share, which is saving the world? Just a small thing like saving the world. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> and um I think basketball coaches of all people know this almost better than anyone. And the knowing of it just sometimes needs uh, some validation and language, um, which is something I've been trying to do for a long time. And this book and the course I teach at NYU is, is the manifestation of that, which is this game is actually social a social institution and an academic institution in my eyes, as much as it is an athletic institution. In other words, every coach that's listening now and every coach that's teaching basketball right now is actually teaching those young people the exercise of being a better person in the world in a number of ways. And we're going to get into a number of those ways. And uh, maybe we should go back and just start with the premise of the book, which is kind of this view that uh, the world has broken in some way. And I think we all identify with that, that there's things, whether they're politics, culture or commerce. So just curious, then, can you expand on this and then kind of I'm guessing that's the impetus that led to this book? Yeah, uh, you know, it even it even um, it, you know, there are so many stages along the way. I've been thinking about this for about 15 years um, after I read a wonderful book called How Soccer Explains the World by Franklin Foer. Um, he wrote that about the onset of globalization, um, using the World Cup as kind of a peg to uh, explore every country and the way their, their teams play soccer and try and make a statement about each country through their soccer playing. And I thought to myself, man, basketball, I know it can even tell this better it can even save the world uh and then come around right 2016 <laughs> with all the division in the world um and the pandemic of course laying bare the failure of so many institutions it was clear that we're in a broken world um broken from political institutions to media institutions to educational institutions to all kinds of, of ways we used to count on. And I believe it's because we've been drawing the, the value system for those institutions, the basis for those institutions from the same kinds of leaders who come up with the same kinds of broad philosophies, isms, I call them, right? Capitalism, socialism, communism, deism, theism, utilitarianism, existentialism, whatever your ism is, I no longer care because I believe that different versions of these isms have continued to get us into different and more progressively worse states of confusion and conflict. And so I said to myself, isn't there another... <laughs> thing we can look to, a new source of ideas, a new a new basis of values. And I know, like so many of the people on this podcast know, that basketball has always provided me with balance, peace, sanctuary, 
a way of right relations with others, a way of integrating my best self and whole self, a sanctuary um, where the world made sense. And I wanted to see how I could take that and make it that new source of ideas, that new basis of values, that new vocabulary to apply to fixing acutely 21st century problems. Basketballism, you know, as a basketball as a source. So that, that was the long answer uh, of, of, you know, very important and to me, very powerful new way of approaching how we go forward. I love it. And uh, you mentioned other sports and uh, let's maybe first, cause I, I'm a sports fan. You're probably a sports fan. Let's <laughs> distinguish the difference between basketball and other sports, because I feel it. I feel it, but I'm a basketball coach. So I feel like I'm biased. So maybe from your perspective, yeah. why is basketball particularly suited to change some of these things? That's right. And, and, and important to say that, look, I, I'm, I'm a huge sports fan. I I've played all different sports. I, I believe you can find wonderful, valuable things from so many different sports. But as you say, I believe basketball is especially good um, at solving human problems because it's human in size, first of all. Um, the game was meant in its you know fullest elongation uh, to be 94 feet larger than, than field sports. Um, and because of the spatial intimacy of basketball, because it's only five on a side, you do something in other sports, large sports, uh, you, you see each other. You immediately start thinking about other people. You immediately enter a group of, of could be strangers, and each of you begins to, uh, as the, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet uh, Natalie Diaz says, enact a family you you begin to start thinking about each other a lot immediately fluidly um you are forced to do that in the interconnectedness of basketball it's positionlessness there's no other sport even the sports that kind of resemble it hockey and soccer um the goalie has radically different powers than everyone else and typically the defensive players don't spend that much time in the offensive area Basketball, you switch from offense to defense. The the whole conception of the fast break to me is is the way we live life. Uh, you are adjusting the facts and circumstances on the ground collaboratively with other people. It's this kind of 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 ritual exercise, playing of basketball, that you may not know this, but when you're playing it, when you're taught to play it right. You're building the kinds of skills that makes you a 21st century problem-solving person. So many coaches are nodding their heads. And, and as you said, one of the powers of yours is that you're putting words to this and phrasing to this that will help us all continue to share this. And, and I love so many ways that you approach this. But the other part of basketball is that it's it's truly global, unlike some other sports, truly global, and particularly amongst young people, it has really captured young people, hasn't it? Every basketball player should know that what they're feeling is not a surprise. Uh, in other words, this feeling that they can enter this space uh, and communicate immediately with anyone, anywhere, uh, because the accessibility, which was intended, by the way, uh, by the, the guy who invented the game, James Nace, with the accessibility, the ease of play, um, uh, you just put a hoop up 10 feet tall on the side of a barn on a pole, uh, which could be in a city in, a, in the plains uh, of, 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 of Africa, doesn't matter, has allowed this game to have such ubiquity, to have such growth as the world has changed over the 130 years basketball has existed. You know, countries have formed and deformed. Nations have, have renamed themselves. Trends have come and gone. You know, leaders have, have passed on. This thing continues to grow. This is one thing that everyone seems to, you know, my friend Dan Clores, uh, who, who did, you know, made the great basketball films, Basketball Love Story, says basketball's a global common denominator. There's only a few things you can talk about in the world 
wherever you go, uh, you know, love, sex, music, food. Basketball is one of those things. You might say, well, soccer, what about that? It, it, not as much in North America or in, in, in America as, as it is in other parts of, as basketball is in other parts of the world. So um, it, it's a remarkable global language uh, that truly is, you're able to speak it, enter it, uh, recognize it as soon as you see it and be like, okay, I'm cool here. Um, wow. What a, what a, what a gift to be taught that life skill to have that, 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 that passport, um, in the world as a person. When I read the book, it reconnected me with so much of Eastern philosophy that I've read in the past, because what, what that connected for me and which I think you beautifully do is this balance, this harmony that exists in a basketball world, in a basketball setting, whether it's a practice or a game or as a fan. And I'll give you a quick example is that basketball balances the ability to be selfish and unselfish at the same time. And where selfishness is truly a benefit, because if I can score, it benefits me, but it also benefits our team. And obviously, if I can't score, it's usually because I can now share the ball and create an opportunity for someone else. And this this harmony and this balance that exists is is that part of what you've loved about the game as well? It is, and it's it's the it's also the 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 way the game values those who contribute to balance. Uh, I, I I cite kind of Draymond Green as one example. Um, I know he's a, a a polarizing figure sometimes for for people, but the truth is, is that in the success, and this is one example, in the success of the Golden State Warriors. Draymond Green, whose statistics are never, uh, not not always bowling you over, not even consistent. His presence allows the phenomenal uh, uh, performances of Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, once Kevin Durant, Jordan Poole now. Um, The game says no matter where you are in the chain of contribution to the ultimate goal of our team, extrapolate that to our society. We value you. We value just as much Draymond Green. We value just as much Nick Collison, who I, 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 you know, he's, he's the only player his Jersey retired by the Oklahoma city thunder. He's a big 12 scoring champ. The guy could score twice. Big 12 scoring champ. Stop scoring in the NBA to balance and they knew that they they appreciated that. This is what I, I believe our society could kind of <laughs> use a little more of, which is you know we have massive problems. We have wealth inequality. That's an imbalance. Access imbalances. Um, all you know imbalances. Healthcare spread across the, the the all kinds of spectrum of our society. We've got to take a more basketballistic approach, which is, yeah, I get it. Some people are really good at this. Some people are really good at that. But you're both important. You're all important in order for the in, the collective to succeed. Well, Great and basketball to, thing. Yeah, and to carry on that point about Draymond Green, like obviously Steph Curry appreciates Draymond Green to a level that – Probably none of us ever could, right? So that's an example of saying a millionaire appreciating someone who's doing something to help society and themselves. I love that. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's it's a perfect analogy. And I, if I'm a basketball coach and I'm trying to explain the why, what are we doing here? Why should, why should I give up the ball? Why should I? They need to know that What we're doing is (laughs) we're living at a very high level here as a basketball team. We're talking about not individuated performance like in baseball where, you know, it has nothing to do with each other. Sometimes I could, you know, again, it's not against baseball. I love baseball. I I love the clockless, you know, uh, ideology. Basketball is about humans figuring out how to do stuff together. And one of the things we're not doing well (laughs) Is balance is sharing and appreciating each other's contributions, um, uh, balance. So I, I I love it and I appreciate you bringing that up. I love that and the values of cooperation you mentioned and then this this belonging. 
which is really, I think, what it comes down to a lot in the world is some people don't feel like they belong and they don't belong with other people. They don't belong in certain institutions and all this stuff. And really in a basketball setting, we all feel like we belong, whatever our role. You know, it's, uh, I, I, uh, you know, what you're doing is going through these 13 principles that I've, I've kind of constructed, Mm -hmm. uh, from basketball. It's a philosophy. It's my 10 commandments, uh, if you will, it's my, my, you know, and and one of those principles is the game was meant for the other, the outsider, the other, and the masses. The game was always constructed as a social institution to allow, in a time of unprecedented immigration in the United States, to allow folks who felt like they didn't belong, belong. How would we get them to do that? How would we give them the chance to demonstrate their their Americanness, their citizenship? By the way, this was the invention of a guy who was an immigrant from another country, Canada, to the United States. Now, granted, he looked a lot like the 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 ruling Anglo class, but having that insider outsider perspective, I bet Im- imbued him with a certain empathy for the outsider. Um, his parents, by the way, were from Scotland. Uh, and so historically, this game was meant to give access and belonging to those who weren't allowed to go onto the fields. To They couldn't afford uh, membership to the, uh, the great lawns. They were often excluded. And then we're talking about Eastern European Jews and Southern European Catholics, of course, Blacks. Um, so Naismith creates this vehicle that historically has given newcomers uh, a way to demonstrate their belonging. And you say, well, that was cool 130 years ago. You know, um, you know, is that really the case for this game now? I think the greatest story, basketball story ever told is the story of Canada and Toronto specifically, and the way that country and city, because it's the, that country now takes more immigrants than any other country, pound for pound, Toronto, more than any other city in Canada does it, and the confluence of how they've used basketball um, in a city and country where now two out of every five, I think the latest statistics ever is one out of every three, persons is either from somewhere else or one parent from somewhere else and have given them basketball has become a an immigration absorption vehicle if other countries <laughs> would replicate the basketball belonging principle that toronto has if they would do it in marseille and malmo in phoenix i i just i believe basketball could heal um uh, you know, and, and 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 just to extend it one step further, another principle is that it's this game has been an antidote to loneliness and isolation. You know, I had one of the great trauma specialists in the world, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who's written this book, The Body Keeps the Score. It's a 320 weeks straight on you know, bestseller list to redefine our understanding of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. He says there are only a few things really that can help people suffering from PTSD, Um, people who are walking around this world closed, living in searing isolation, unable to connect uh, because they see the world as a threat, because even though the trauma happened a long time ago, they they walk around experiencing as if it's happened now. How do do these poor people enter, you know, the, the world, connect? He says, well, group rhythmic exercises like dancing, singing, and specifically basketball. This is what we're doing with our game. I love this. And I love your Canada example. Being Canadian, so many people ask me, like the second most number of players in the NBA, the rise of basketball in the country is directly connected to immigration. Yes. Former Yugoslavia, obviously, and then obviously Africa, Caribbean, all the immigration that came from those countries. Those kids weren't coming to play hockey. Basketball brought them (laughs) all together. And that's, that's right. what's been beautiful about it. And I t- could not agree more with your example. It, it, it's a, it's amazing. I My wife is Canadian. So for the past 20 years, I've been going up there and having eyewitness to 
young people also, even if they were, you know, two generations in Canadian, it's their sport. They're not, the, the, the real Canada is not happening in, the, in, in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It's happening at the corner of Jane Finch. Yep. And it's just, you know, yeah, like ice and skates. For a lot of these folks, it's a totally strange thing and it's expensive. It's hard. There's so many barriers to to entry and to access. It's it's unbelievable what Canada has done with basketball and is doing. Yeah, and no barrier to access is another one of your principles. And I'll go through them a little bit more specifically. But uh, I want to come back to the one where you said antidote to isolation and loneliness. Because I can't tell you. I mean, any time, even to this day, there is nothing more freeing than being in a gym alone or being on a court alone and just shooting because to remove some of that isolation, I feel sometimes or depression or sadness, because I'm human. I go through those emotions. Basketball takes me always to a place of daydreaming. And I, when you start shooting and playing and doing some things, you immediately go to this place of daydreaming where I believe you connect with this collective consciousness of the game and all these other people that are doing the same thing. It's such a beautiful thing. Such a beautiful thing. And I, everyone I know who has played this game, and not even talking at the elite levels, just anyone who picks up a ball, you, it's first of all, it's the only it's the only sport you can team sport. You can do by yourself. It's you why that connected with me as a young person instead of yeah. hockey or soccer. I could just right. play basketball by myself. I could just go out and shoot. And what you said is it's the consistent response of everyone who plays this game, which is it opens your imagination. And when you open imagination, you can begin to believe that you can do something greater than is in your current reality, which is <laughs> the challenge of any world, of any society. Do we want to continue to like recycle the old Hatreds, <laughs> the old, uh, 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 you know, economic recession, depression, resentment, uh, antitrust. Do you want to recycle all these, 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 these things we've gone through? War. Look at what's happening in Europe. When you have a vehicle, my vehicle, your vehicle is basketball, where you can go. You know, some people like to sit and meditate. You know. I, all good. I'm saying this thing gives you that exact same transcendence, that exact same vision of, oh shit, I did. Sorry. I didn't know that I could see this happening. This is the power of the game, the sanctuary from, uh, Another principle, the sanctuary of a world which, well, is constantly kind of algorithmically limiting you, trapping you, telling you about what you said yesterday in order to make you do again what you did yesterday. It, 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 it basketball is the place where you're free. Love that. And, uh, you know, to me, the other part of it that uh, connected with reading this book is just that you keep coming back in my mind, to common sense, which yeah. which basketball seems to connect us to common sense. Okay, David's better than I am. I'm still a good player, but David's better than I am, so he should shoot more than me, and we don't have an issue with that. It's just common sense, and that seems to be something that's lacking in politics, culture, the world a little bit. It's just common sense. Why do we yeah. care what someone else believes or wants to do as long as it doesn't? In, it's not impacting us, and that's kind of the idea. David wants to wear high socks. I wear low socks. Who cares? <laughs> it doesn't matter in basketball, does it? No, it doesn't. This this whole zero sum mentality of the only way I can win is if you lose mm -hmm. um, that has dominated our our business culture, our political culture. Um, it, you know, where politics is no longer politics. Politics used to be the art of figuring out how we can work together, even if I don't agree with you on everything. Now, politics is crush you. Basketball says just what you articulated, which is 
we can all be here together, even if we have different talents, even if we yeah, like socks up or socks down, you know, every kind of, and there's proof of it, right? So there's proof of it in Peace Players International, which is an award-winning global program that goes to the highest conflict spots in the world and uses basketball to bring people together from cultures who've been told to hate each other. And scientifically, They've 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 done randomized controlled study over seven years to prove that basketball is a thing because of the spatial intimacy, because they see each other as people, because they they begin to to humanize each other. Basketball is the one thing that works that makes them leave the court as pro social, proactive spreaders of cooperation, tolerance you know, understanding um, the the Boston Celtics, uh, who were the, uh, the, the the Garnett, Pierce, um, uh, Ray Allen, the, the original big three, how are they going to get along? They used this wonderful South African uh, Zulu-based concept, which uh, in broader Africa is also well-known, called Ubuntu, which means literally, I am because you are. In other words, I have absolutely no conception of myself um, unless it has a connection to you, being who you are. A l- last little illustration, uh, and I, I mention it in the book, you know, I was once listening to a radio broadcast where Bill Russell was being asked by um, um, Sonny Hill, another basketball Hall of Famer. I read, he said, this was the time when Sha- Shaquille O'Neal was so physically dominant, no one could stop him. Uh, he was the Goliath of his age, and and he asked Bill Russell, who had stopped the Goliath of his age, Will Chamberlain, he said, you know, Bill, how would you stop Shaquille O'Neal? And I'm listening to this radio show, and Russell pauses, like for an uncomfortable, like almost full <laughs> 10 seconds before he answers. He's like, I wouldn't. And Sonny Hill's like, you wouldn't? He's like, no, my team would. This is the game of basketball. It, and by the way, that's the answer from the most successful in terms of championships. And last I looked, that's the idea. And he has far more than anyone else. He has 11. Um, and two NCAA championships. Um, uh, the idea that I don't do anything that's not connected to everyone else on this court. What a game to be that interrelated. What a what a what a model <laughs> for a community, for a municipality, for a country, for a world. Such an appreciation for what you're saying. And my nine-year-old daughter asked me the other day after we watched the end of an NBA game, and she saw the players, the opponents, going and finding each other and dapping each other and, you know, all that different thing. And we formalize it at the youth level where you have to do these handshake lines. But to me, I explained it to her is this is the beauty of the game is that they're essentially thanking each other for competing because they're making money because the other players playing against them and they're creating this cooperation in terms of creating this environment where we can watch it, we can be entertained with it, we can pay for it, and it's all celebrated. But then after the fact, it's all appreciated. And this is really the point of all of this stuff. If whether whatever political view you have at the end of it, let's appreciate the fact that we're all in this together. There's a reason why basketball electrifies a global level. Um, you can get closer to it. As a as a as a fan, as someone who's watching, right? So we've talked about playing, but those who watch it and appreciate it for whatever reasons they do, they get can get closer to this action than any other sport as a fan, physically closer. And also closer in another way, we really do those who play, they're playing in their underwear. Um, there's no helmets, there's no hats, there's no you know, uh, obscuring of the fullness of who they are. I love that. Um, I love that this game, you know, exposes us to each other, which really brings us to a much higher level of relationships. Uh, That's why I'm 
I feel so connected to complete strangers that I play pickup with. I may not know their name. They may not know mine, but if I see them, I'm like, hey, hey, man. And he's like, hey, man, because we know who we are to each other. It's amazing in those situations, too, how quickly you connect with them and you start to figure out strengths and weaknesses and you appreciate and you just are there in the moment with no past, no future, just this present, right, where you're just there. And that's such a beautiful place to be with another human being, isn't it? You know, it, it it's 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 the kind of game that you know all 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 sports, I suppose, are trying to create pure play, this removal uh, from the real world. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people like to say, you know, sports is sports is like life. No, it's not actually. It's it's meant to not be like life life is incomprehensible uh uh you know that life has unpredictable has uh, uh sprawling very difficult unsolvable questions of love and you know uh uh and and very dire consequences of hunger and and death and things like that when you play pure play a game athletic play we feel the safety of being enclosed in, we know where the inbounds is, we know where out of bounds is, we know what the rules are, we know where the, the location is, we know when the beginning begins and ends, whether it's time after, you know, 40 minutes or, or first one to 11. And this safe space allows us to completely explore all the, 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 the full virtues of, of, of being a human being and vices, it, we we can demonstrate our heroism, leadership, cowardice, teamwork, grace under pressure, um, uh, a failure, without the consequences of real life, death, hunger, loss, um, and for so many who play basketball, we to that space to have that feeling i i you know i say in the book and it's really important for people to to know this it's easy to forget now and i feel like many have but there was a time during the pandemic when we none of us knew when we were going to be able to get back together when any of us were able going to 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 have a normal time and and we told ourselves we would be different you know once this thing is over but in the pandemic, there was one thing that people would not stop playing. Even though we were told, hey, if you go near people, <laughs> you could die. This is before the vaccines are in. And that was basketball. You know, and all these coaches know, they were mayors and governors, and this is all over the world, who were making public service announcements saying, stop playing basketball. And taking down the hoops. <laughs> taking down the rims. They were like, we, yeah. this is it. They, they won't stop. It didn't matter what they said. They wouldn't stop, so they had to take down the rims. Tell me anything else in the world that people had to have. So it, it was part of their, it was it was like like part of their survival, part of like, like, I don't care. I must have this. That is an extraordinary illustration of what, this means to people's health and writ large the health that that means to a society that says we're okay here um, we're healthy we like to be with each other basketball was i mean i i <laughs> i wish people would talk about that more so we talked about like how basketball can save the world and i know you've mentioned the 13 principles and we've talked about some of them i'll just quickly because you know what coaches love David, they love lists. They love lists. I know that. So we'll just give it to them quickly. Uh, number one, cooperation. Two, balance of individual and collective. Three is balance of force and skill. We haven't really talked about that one. So let's talk about balance of force and skill. What does that mean in terms of saving the world? Yeah. Um, basketball is a very different game. Uh, in fact, it's the only sport that has an elevated goal. Um, so you can't just through brute force, cross that physical plane 
whether that line is the touchdown, the the the, the hockey goal, the soccer goal, the strike zone in baseball. Um, so you can't just with sheer power and speed win. This is a game that was intentionally created to prize both that kind of power, but also insisted that you be under control, insisted that you have touch and finesse, arc. Um, of course, he never imagined how much above the rim uh, so much of the game would be, but still, it's the same thing. And because of that, all of a sudden, you saw all kinds of different types of athletic ability being valued in the game of basketball. It wasn't just the muscle. Um, it wasn't just the overwhelming speed or power. It was the skill, the ability to have timing and and touch and 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 different bodies, different sizes um, were valued and recognized. And how does that save the world? Well, you know, we've got to start from a human resources perspective, valuing more than just the power, the loud, charismatic types, um, wealthy, you know, handsome like you. Um, uh, we have <laughs> we have to see a world where all kinds of talent is able to lead thoughtfulness, introspectiveness, um, um, creative types, uh, which is an inclusive model which is a good corporate policy, a good recruitment policy, a good way to look at kids who are applying to college. You know, we, we've got to start having different ways of evaluating each other, not just kind of the blunt force tools of, of either standardized tests or, or uh, you know, these kind of, raw um oh you can run this fast you can jump this high there's so much more nuance to the human condition and basketball at its root said we're going to value that we're going to let you see that um and that that's what i mean by that principle well i love it because i mean it speaks to the example too of how hard it is to label someone Right. It, it, you're not just strong. You're not just fast. You're you're a blend. You're a combination of things. And that's what a good basketball player is. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I mentioned the example in the book of Will Chamberlain. A lot of people, I think, misunderstood. I think he was way ahead of his time. He was a guy who actually liked doing the finesse things. He invented the finger roll. He, he, he Today, you see just hugely built guys doing the little things and you see uh diminutive or so-called small guys doing um you know dominating uh types of activities and 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 yeah that's the, when you're born on this earth whatever your package is i actually believe you have a lot greater potential than the very narrow kind of evaluation that we've been kind of living under for a long time and it speaks to number four, which is positionless. And I know you've talked about that a little bit, but basketball is such a great representation of that. And then number five, human alchemy. Explain that to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, once you uh, uh, value different types of people, and once you see that none of us are just one thing, positionlessness, that's the state of basketball right now, right? That's what everybody says is the ideal state. Well, that was always what it was meant to be. Um, Naismith even sat with John McClendon, uh, his last disciple and his most important one, in my opinion, uh, and said, listen, it's like, there's no positions here. You attack on offense and you attack on defense and you do it all game and that's the game. Gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
when you understand that, then you can really become something that you never ever were before when you join a team and let each other affect each other. When Naismith was tasked with building this game, the guy in charge, Luther Gulick, famous uh, uh, sports philosopher said, listen, just, just take pieces of other known games and put them together. And that's what a lot of people like to talk about, team chemistry. That, that's, that's actually what chemistry is. Alchemy is not, okay, this piece could go here with this piece. Alchemy is like, because I throw you all together in a mix, you're actually going to, you're all going to become something that you've never been, you're going to not just become better, you're going to become different. Mm -hmm. Alchemy is, we will transform you. Basketball teams at their best become something else. The players become something else they never would without each other. Mixed against what they have to overcome in the opposition. And this kind of alchemy, this kind of like, I become something else because the world demands it. And because I've now mixed in with all the other people in this world at this time. Well, if the pandemic proved anything, we all had to have been saying to ourselves at some point during it, we can no longer after this be what we once were. We can no longer be the same person, the same institution. I'm not going back to work. Um, LeBron James is an example of a person who did some alchemizing when he turned stadiums into voting booths because there was a problem with access to voting, which got uh, 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 Jose, um, the, the guy, who, Jose Andres, the guy who does the world kitchens, who said, well, they could be food kitchens too, which got everybody thinking they could also be mass vaccination sites. And you start to, when you alchemize, when the world begins to alchemize is the only time when we begin to really change as a world. And we say, okay, we don't have to be what we, you know, everybody's talking about, and they talked about it during the pandemic. We're going to reset. We're going to reform. We're going to uh, 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 reimagine. We're going to redefine <laughs> all these re and add your, 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 your suffix to it. Basketball is the model for the way that kind of alchemy, what they're talking about, that kind of like total reimagining of how we're going to use office buildings, total reimagining of what we need to do with our, our, our schools, total reimagining, you know, everybody loves to talk about this stuff or how we're going to uh, uh, handle our carbon emissions. That's a basketball mentality that comes from seeing people as not as positionless, understanding that we can all be something more than we are and different than we are now, which is better than what we were because it's what the world needs to be better. Gandhi said famously, you must become the change you wish to see. This is what great basketball teams do. And this is a principle that is actually world saving, changing. Well, you've said it so beautifully. And it, it, again, the best coaches for me don't force this either. They allow this to happen. They they create space for this to happen. And I feel that's such a change in coaching as well, where you're seeing the coaches really adapt to modern world and modern society faster than others, because they understand that they can't force this. They have to allow it and create the space and help direct yeah. it rather than force it, right? Oh my God, that's such a great point. I mean, the, the great coaches you see now are are almost like um, uh, they're conducting a jazz band. They're letting, you know, they're, you know, they're seeing who's got to go create now, who's got to innovate now. Okay, yeah, you come, you know, and they're, they're, they're it's not like it's undisciplined. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. It's a, a real understanding of here's the range of things you can do now. Now, let's see. And, and every game is different. And every, you know, every game you alchemize differently um yeah those are the great coaches they're they're just master conductors um of an orchestra and you but spoke to that already sorry to interrupt but you spoke to that already about being adaptable 
And that's where the adaptability comes into play. It's not one thing for four years. It's adaptability within. We don't have time in basketball most of the time to set up, (laughs) to go back to the huddle, to, you know, step out of the batter's box. Um, This is a game where studied preparation of the new situation, you know, in the open court, guys filling the, you know, guys coming from here, coming from there. Uh, When I say guys, I mean men and women. Um, uh, That's what basketball is. And it's much more proximate to life, to a conversation like what you and I are doing now. I don't know what you're going to ask me. I don't know where this is going. And, and so we're, you know, this is, I'm having an alchemical experience with you. Um, and it's beautiful and it, and it feels good. And, and we know it's going well. And this is, this is, you know, basketball players know how to do that with other people. And that works in the office. If we're still going to have offices that works when you're out on the street, you know, coming out of the subway. That works like in in a classroom. Basketball players know how to. Sue Bird, you know, I once talked to her about this. I'm like, because she was talking about like the spatial relationship. Space is such a big thing that coaches try to teach. Good spacing. Basketball players, she's like, we know how to have that space with each other. I know the space I need to have with Brianna Stewart and how to close down space, how to create space. And she's like, and I said, well, do you think that makes you a better person when you're just walking on the sidewalk? You start talking about that. And she's like, yeah, it does. You know, like when I'm in the mall, when I'm like, I know how to move. Beautiful. Very simple, very simple, cooperative thing to do with other people out on the street, just know how to move, how to give way, how to let you know, let you go where you got to go. Give and go. Yeah, I love how you've connected so many things to life. And and it's true. Like, I mean, space is a part of life. You need it or you create it or, you know, you need to, and the other part that I use with phrasing is figure it out. Constantly saying figure it out as a coach, because yeah. again, I can give you my solution, but what's best is either we co-create the solution or you come up with a solution. And ultimately that empowers us much longer than me selling you the answer. You know, it's shock to a lot of people when they, uh, and I, 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 found this uh, in researching Naismith. Uh, Fog Allen was Naismith's first disciple when he went to Kansas. He recruited him to come play at Kansas. And uh, and then Allen, uh, very early into his time at Kansas, came to Naismith and said, hey, I've been asked to be a coach at Baldwin College. And Naismith is like, what? He's like, basketball is not a game you coach. It's a game you play. <laughs> Love now that. He didn't mean no coaching. Yeah. He meant what you just said. Um, figure it out. This is a game where we're on the court. I've, I've told you guys the fundamental. I've told you guys what's happening here. I'll call a timeout if things are getting out of hand, but this is a, a place where you grow with each other. Um, you, you figure it out. And uh, number six, make it global. We've talked about number seven, gender inclusive or being inclusive in general. So maybe just expand on that one a little bit because such an important one. Yeah. And this is meant uh, as, you know, what the game stands for, um, what it was meant to stand for, even if it has not fulfilled that promise and which may just be the reflection of a, just a society that still has a lot of growing to do in the area of gender relations. But when James Mason first invented the game, a week into it, two weeks into it, said nobody's quite sure. The records on Naismith are, are not 100% accurate. Uh, but as I dug in with the Springfield College historian um, and every, everything that's been written, just a few weeks in, when the guys are playing pickup during the time in the gym where Naismith is now introduce this game. Uh, grade school teachers from uh, the, the 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 nearby grade school would take their lunch break, female grade school teachers, and sit and watch them play basketball. And just a few weeks in, one of them or two of them comes up to Nathan and says, hey, could we play this too? Could we do this on our lunch break? And without hesitation, 
Naismith said, yeah, why not? I'm not going to say that he intentionally sought <laughs> the inclusion of, of uh, male and female. Um, and of course, he had no conception of, you know, the, 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 the larger uh, uh, gender inclusion concept, non-binary. But he had absolutely no objection to women playing this game. In fact, he was delighted by it. And, and no other sport so near to its conception included women. Um, this was 30 years before women had the right to vote in the United States. And this is a radical, and it became a female, basketball became a female empowerment vehicle um, uh, adapted immediately uh, by Smith College sent send a Berenson uh, down the road and then and then Berkeley played Stanford in the first women's college game and 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 then I mean it became it was on the it was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post uh, a classic American institution it, it was like basket women, women playing basketball wow I say gender inclusion because my point in that chapter is, at its core, the institution of basketball included women. And at its core, from now on, and anytime, you got an idea, you got a policy, you got a plan, it better be gender inclusive. I mean, full on gender inclusive, all genders, um, all uh, 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 self-determined genders, or it's going to fail. And the stakes are very high if you do not do that, because guess what? They're all of us. <laughs> and the health of our society is directly related to how we treat each other in the areas of gender relations. It, it's just that, you know, every country has different kinds of ethnic and racial conflicts. Every country has gender, every country. I'm just picturing everyone as they're listening to this, whether they listen or however they listen to it, are just nodding their head like I am to so many things that you're saying. And uh, again, coming back to this common sense and how beautifully you put it. Uh, let me just get through the list here and then I'll let you talk about some of them maybe that you want to expand on. Uh, eight is no barrier to access. Nine for the outsider, the other and the masses. Ten, urban and rural. 11, the antidote to isolation and loneliness, which we talked about, then 12, the sanctuary, and then 13, transcendence. And uh, it, the 13 principles is just an easy way to be able to uh, flow through the book. And obviously, they connect with us on so many levels. But uh, maybe what are some of those ones that you want to kind of expand on a little bit for us? Um, you know, uh, let me touch on urban and rural. I'll just touch on the ones we, uh, yep. one we didn't. Um, uh, there are very few things these days uh, that, and you know, and, and that 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 we agree on. And urban and rural has become a uh, uh, an American division point, as well as all over the world. I mean, the, the, it seems that we are now clustering um, geographically. Uh, with those who think like us and the division is in the habits uh, of our political choices what we watch on television um, all kinds of uh, cultural and religious values it's a problem we're having a hard time finding anything that we can start with to begin to have a conversation and i claim um and i think it's undisputed that basketball is beloved deeply in both urban and rural communities. Meaning I could be from one and go to the other. And when I see that thing, that space, that basketball court, it's almost like, okay, that's my coat of arms. I am welcome here. I know this language. And it can be a symbol uh, 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 that stands for, you know, once we get on that basketball court, whether I'm someone from a rural community coming to an urban uh, basketball court or someone from an urban community coming to a rural basketball court, we begin to speak that common language. Um, and from 
that common language, in that commonly understood space, it is my belief that from there we begin to find, because we have this thing in common, that we can find other things in common and begin to build a world where we can come back together. Um, you know, the great illustration of, oh, they were so different in terms of urban and rural. They were bird and magic. And when they finally did get together, they became best friends. They shared a value system based in this in this game. And, you know, I, I'm a great fan of Project Backboard. I'm a great fan of uh, Dan Peterson and his group who build courts. I go speak uh, and people ask me, you know, well, what should we do? What should be the next? What's the first best thing we could do? I said, build courts. Build basketball courts because those are the places where we come together. And it's, you know, it, it ties directly into the antidote to isolation and loneliness. It ties directly into we need more spaces where people can find sanctuary. In other words, the principle of sanctuary to be separated from the oppression of what is a 21st century life of digital surveillance, digital updating, um, you know, constant algorithmic kind of counting and and classifying and categorizing uh, of ourselves and of our activity, geolocating us. We need to demand spaces of sanctuary. I'm not talking about immigration sanctuary. I'm talking about just a place where I can feel my humanity, which actually is the place where humanity begins to grow not uh, feel distracted, um, have our uh, uh, attention divided, um, have ourselves kind of listened to and watched. Sanctuary is such a, it's such a 21st century issue to have a space of you know, play. Uh, again, it's like basketball save the world, play can save the world. Actually, yes, <laughs> because it provides a place to feel myself and other people. You know, when I play basketball, me, um, and I'm a, I'm a college professor, I speak for a living, I get quiet. Mm. I actually get quiet, man, because, and I believe that's actually my, I'm humming. I'm in a better space. I feel differently. I'm, I don't need to speak it out. I don't need to claim my space. I'm doing fine in the basketball cooperative. I, I think that that, that play space um, matters. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, when I, I explain transcendence, um, again, these are what the game stands for. Um, the first few principles, cooperation, balance of individual, collective, balance for skill, positionlessness, that comes from the playing of the game. Transcendence is, <sighs> the game does have an elevated goal. The game actually asks you to leave the ground, which in other words, asks you to defy your human condition, gravity. That's why we get excited. That's why Michael Jordan has become this symbol. Um, that's why he's on hot, he's on Paris Saint Germain. He's on he's on vaunted soccer brands because he stands for this idea of we can do stuff that we don't think we can. We can defy gravity. We can we can go beyond where we are now in a way that perhaps there's no evidence for, but it requires a dream. It requires the belief in transcendence, the belief that we can go beyond our earthly condition. And so I, I, I end, it's my last principle. It, it's, it, it, it basically says this game actually stands for not just saving the world, but moving it forward, which I think are the same thing. Um, Basketball is about leaving the ground, um, flying, 
Uh, and that basketball dream, that improvement, that saving of the world, the only way you get there is to jump. And it's a basketball message. Well, David, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for adding validation and language to our passion for basketball, playing, coaching, and watching. And uh, just like you referenced, I had no idea where this was going to go as a conversation either. But, but I did know I was going to have a super conversation with someone who unabashedly will share their love of the game. And that is another part of basketball that's so beautiful, isn't it? So many people just share their passion and love for the game in so many ways. Uh, it, it really is. And I'm I'm honored when I... I sit with coaches who think about this so deeply, you know, who, who, who live it every day. And, you know, if I may just, you know, one last comparison, some people are like, man, you know, what are you trying to say? Is this like a religion? <laughs> you know, I say, well, I say it kind of is. Um, and I say, maybe it's even closer to yoga because what's the point of yoga? The point of yoga is um, alignment, mind, body, and soul. Um, and, how do you get that alignment? Well, you do the you do the ritual exercise, you do the poses, physical things, and then you emerge from your doing those physical exercises as a better person in the world, as a more aligned person. I know the same thing happens when you play basketball. I know when you play, you leave that court with all these principles happening. You leave that court endowed with a sense of who you are in this world, how to move and how to be with others. It's not as complicated as we've been led to believe we can do better. Uh, and I know basketball is that exercise. How basketball can save the world.com. And the book is available anywhere you get books nowadays. And uh, uh, David is just tremendous. And I can picture, you know, really as a coach, me getting this book for my administrator, me getting this book for my local politicians, me getting this book for people to inspire them that there is a better path and there's a better way. And there's a way that already exists. And so many things from this book connected with me and I know will connect with others. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, it was an honor to be on this podcast. Thank you for, for the great conversation.